this session, I'm recording it now. I'd like to welcome you to the February 2016 IPMA USA webinar. I'm Dr. Megan Fiorati. I'm the Standards Director for the IPMA USA, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Today's presentation is being given by Stacy Goff, who's the Director of Marketing for IPMA USA. His session, titled Engaging Talent Management to Increase Project Success, is what we'll be offering for approximately the next hour. Stacy is a longtime professional in the project management world. He's currently the CEO of Project Experts, a PPPM consulting and training company. He's co-founder and past president of IPMA USA, and he was also the VP of Marketing and Events for IPMA World from 2011 to 2014. In 2015, Stacy, due to his longtime commitment to the promotion of excellence and dedication to the field of project management, was named an IPMA Honorary Fellow. At this time, I will note that all this presentation is being recorded again and will be available on the IPMA USA organizational website shortly after its completion. Additionally, if you'll need, you will each receive a thank you and a reminder to sign up for our March event, Meet the New Individual Competence Baseline, with our presenter, Tim Jakes. Now we'll turn this over to Stacy. Thank you, Meg. So let's take a look at what we're doing. The IPMA USA webinar series has a a whole bunch of really great sessions. So in addition to this session, you'll learn more about this, uh, about the rest of the dialogue series uh, near the end of this session. So let's see what we're going to talk about in this session. First of all, what is talent and where do we get it? And then the three stages of talent acquisition, development, and retention. Desperately seeking talent, all of us are, and we'll take a look at the talent tetrahedron. The Stairway to Talent Development, Key Project Roles and Their Requirements, and then man Managing Talent Retention. What is talent and where do we get it? Well, there are a lot of pieces of talent. It's more than just knowledge. So if you look at all these things that are flashing on the screen, it spans from knowledge through skills and everything else. So where do we get these things? Well, that's part of what we're going to cover in this particular session. Project talent acquisition, development, and retention. Those are the three stages, and that's the structure of this particular session. In talent acquisition, it's more than a matter of hanging up a help wanted sign. It's far more complex than that, especially where projects are involved. The prerequisites to any valid acquisition is not just a job description, but also a role description. What are the responsibilities and what are the competences that people need, ideally in terms of key competence indicators? We'll talk a little bit later about where you find those. Where do you find fresh talent? Well, a lot of people look to their competition, they look at universities, but the smartest place to find fresh talent is in your own organization. because your own talent already understands the politics, the processes, the business that you're running, and that's the best place to find it, and that's the first place to look. Is this a buyer's market or a seller's market these days? Well, unfortunately, a lot of people think it's a buyer's market, that those who are seeking talent have the power. The truth is, if you have all the right competences, it's a very strong seller's market, and that's internationally, even in soft economies. There are cultural and generational preferences that we need to look at in talent acquisition. For example, the kinds of talent and characteristics we're looking for vary between a developing country and a developed country. It actually varies a lot between different business sectors. For example, construction talent is a lot different, and there are different things that we seek compared to pharma, compared to oil, compared to IT, compared to the other application areas. And then what about the age groups? Whether it's the uh, baby boomers or Gen X or the millennials, there are different preferences, whether you're a buyer or seller, that we need to understand as we're going after new talent. Now, Talent is a challenge for every organization, and I'll assert that project talent is very special. It's much different than general business talent. First of all, projects are unique one-time occurrences. We don't have the chance to 
make it right the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth iteration as we do in general process management. Projects actually change the status quo where most of the rest of business is maintaining the status quo. It takes a lot more momentum to change the status quo because everything else is just inertia. Projects require deep skills in all the roles, not the de-skilling that we saw during the 1980s and early 90s. So projects require deep, broad skills and competences. Projects require very high levels of innovation, independent thinking, creativity, and communication. And without all of that, we have projects with no business goal gain. Project teams don't just work for themselves, they serve as change agents for their beneficiaries. And this requires high levels of engagement, communication, and knowledge transfer. Project talent acquisition, development, and retention is especially complex for projects compared to operations. Now, given that, are we just looking for one kind of talent? The answer is no, not at all, although for 40 years, some professional associations thought all, that's all there was to it. We need a range of talent areas for project, program, and portfolio management success. We start with technical project management and program management talent, and that's a great start, but there's more to it than just a single dot. We need to add to this the interpersonal skills, the leadership talents that are essential to cause people to move from the status quo. So far, so good. In addition to that, we realize that it's necessary to understand the business we're in, the strategies of that business, the strengths of our business compared to our competition, and our weaknesses. All of this is what IPMA has demonstrated for over 20 years with the IPMA competence baseline, and now the IPMA individual competence baseline just announced and available now. But in addition to these three areas, because a triangle is a very strong structure, there's another area of talent that we're going to touch on. It's the piece that's missing in most less successful projects and is always present in the most successful projects. That's product talent. So what's inside all of these talent areas and who needs to have all these talents? Well, let's take a look, first of all, at technical talent. Looking at this list, would a project be successful if these technical PM talents are missing? Resource planning, risk and issue management, contracting and procurement, estimates and delegation, scheduling, cost control. These are the classic technical PM talents that most of us learn at an early early point in our career, and most of us view this as a core part of our, of our competences. This is a great foundation, but it's just the starting point. Because how would a project work if we're missing the interpersonal talents? Leadership, these include, because these are just examples, leadership and influence, sustaining the vision, relationship building, personal communication, conflict and crisis management, results orientation, engagement and teamwork, emotional intelligence, and ethics. So how would your project be if, in fact, this stuff's missing from your project? But there's more. In the talent tetrahedron, the area of enterprise context includes strategic alignment, formal and informal organization, the ability to navigate through the power in both sectors, formal and informal. Prioritization and resourcing, which is absolutely key in most projects. Benefits realization, cultural and values appreciation. Alliance building, managing relationships with suppliers and contractors, and political savvy. Are these talent areas important in your projects? And who's bringing them into your projects? on the products side, understanding the business need, the current problems and opportunities, the business objectives that need to be measured after the project team leaves, the business requirements, the organizational changes, the validation and verification, the testing, 
to make sure it's working, the documentation and training, the solution delivery. You see, even the people who are building the solution need product talent. And then finally, the business benefits and the expected results. Does your project include all of these factors? And if not, what can you do about it? Well, talent development, once you've sourced the talent, the development is the next step. And here the question is, how do we develop talent? Do we just send them away to a class? Or does that really develop it or not? I assert that that's an important foundation, but the real talent begins on the job, in the application. And even there, how do you measure project talent? The truth is, most executives measure project talent by the business results that you create. And who needs talent? Does all of this talent come just from the project managers? Or do other people on the team bring this talent to the project? Let's take a look at what we've talked about so far and how we move into talent in each of these four areas. Long, long ago, I worked on something that was called the taxonomy of data. I used this model this was like mid-1970s, to help executives to understand how to make smarter decisions, management decisions, based on the transformation of data to information to knowledge. And in fact, there's a reference here on this page, dialogue between uh, knowledge management and myself. So uh, it makes for an interesting foundation for this discussion about knowledge management. But the problem was there was a gap between the top level of knowledge and the thing that we wanted most, which was wisdom. And the model failed in the 70s and into the 80s because we didn't know how to close that gap between knowledge and wisdom. Tough problem, right? Well, when we add the discipline of knowledge management and a great reference down there at the bottom of the page, the Knowledge Creating Company by Nonaka and Takuchi, knowledge has two parts. There's explicit knowledge. This is the stuff that you'll find in a body of knowledge, in documentation from a project. It's knowledge that can be codified, written down, shared with others, and understood perhaps with some dialogue. But there's another kind of knowledge, and here's where the secret to knowledge transfer begins. Tacit knowledge is based on your experience. It's internal to a person, and it's very difficult to transfer to others. So the reference down at the bottom of the page is an entire book about how knowledge-creating companies transfer that tacit knowledge to others on their teams. Because tacit knowledge is the key to transforming explicit knowledge into experience for those who haven't yet had that experience. So if we take our earlier model, instead of having the will-of-the-wisp of wisdom that we never quite figured out how to transfer, we add tacit knowledge, which includes skills, attitudes, competence, and moves us towards performance. Now taking a look at the axes on this chart, we can see transfer difficulty moving from low to high. Then on the lower axis, we see business performance impact moving from low to very high. So what we're looking for is high impact talent, but you can see that the higher we go on the impact, the higher it is to transfer. So looking at ways to harness tacit knowledge and move from knowledge through skill, and you see we still have this gap, to attitudes, to competence, and then to performance. This is the challenge in talent management today. But there's more to that. The classic ASK model, attitudes, skills, and knowledge, which is part of the learning objective classification in all types of learning, talks about attitudes, skills, and knowledge as three different levels of intensity in learning. Bloom's taxonomy, with its six levels of learning, 
talks about simple recall all the way up through synthesis of new information. So both of these help us bridge this gap between knowledge and skill and then beyond because attitude, skill, and knowledge are the key to foundation learning. And then factors such as Kirkpatrick's evaluation model which not only deal with classroom learning, but whether it's applied on the job and whether it actually achieves the business results that we're seeking, performance and results. That's the top level of talent transfer. And you can see again that the transfer difficulty is very high, but the business performance impact is also very, very high. Stacey. Let's take an example. If yes. we have a question, can you go back to the prior okay, slide, please? It. Yes. Can you explain how the Kirkpatrick's Kirk, Kirk evaluation model is implemented? Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. Kirkpatrick talks about, so part of it is understanding what the model is, but it begins with smile sheets from a class. It then moves into, into post-class retention of that moves into whether people are demonstrating it on the job, and finally tops out at can you identify how this actually helped either, typically not the business at large, but the business area, how, for example, better estimating wasn't just repeating a formula, but you actually produced better estimates, and the people who worked on the project agree that you produced better estimates. So that's competence to performance measures, and it's uh, like all learning, because learning involves levels one through five, it's difficult to measure, but the more mature you are as a learning organization, the easier it is to measure. It's usually survey-driven or interview-driven with evidence provided. Okay? Thank, thank you very much. So the example, remember when you learned how to drive? We started perhaps with a driver's manual and watching other people in the way that they drove. And after you studied that driver's manual, you took an exam and you received a learner's permit. Now here's a question. Are you an expert driver at this point? Well, I'd say probably not. And in fact, a learner's permit just says you're ready to start learning how to drive. Once again, we have the skill gap. So during this knowledge learner permit era, you are required in most countries and states to have somebody who already has a full driver's license and you are practicing to start developing the skills of driving. And it's not all of the skills, it's five or six classic skills like stopping on a hill and starting, parking, staying in your lane, signaling before you turn, and things like that. That still doesn't make you an expert driver, but once you pass that driving test, they're not looking for memorized driver's manual. They're looking for demonstrated experience at this point. The next level up is understanding the attitudes around your driving. Typically, with driving, this includes courtesy of signaling before you turn, being able to allow somebody else to get the parking space that you thought that you saw first. There are a whole range of attitudes in driving that are essential today, and yet you know a lot of people who are not yet competent even in their attitudes. And speaking of competence, competence takes all of that driving and establishes true proficiency. If you started learning to drive with an automatic transmission, have you learned how to drive with a clutch? That's taking one set of skills and putting them into different situations. Here's another situation, driving in the rain, driving in the snow. This stretches your competences in the arena of driving. How about this? Driving a semi-truck with a long, 40-foot long trailer. That's yet another expansion of your proficiency, expanding your competences in driving. Well, are we there yet? Well, no. What could possibly be beyond the competence level? Well, at a performance level, I'd say winning races. Now, that might seem to be a large gap 
up from competence, which we talked about. And in fact, there are probably only 1% of all people who are competent as drivers who move on to race and win. But we see that five to 10 times gap at each level in our talent progression from knowledge to skill is a huge jump that some people never master from skill to attitudes. Well, I'm afraid I still see lots of people who don't understand even the need for the right attitudes and on to competence. So the outcome of the model is something like winning races in that driving example. And yep, that's me winning races. And that's another story. The impact of achieving those needed talent levels, little to no benefit from knowledge. You see, knowledge by itself is like potential energy. It doesn't accomplish anything until it's harnessed and applied. Skill becomes kinetic energy, and through application, we start seeing benefits. But even, on, even here on the business performance impact, we're only still at the center of the impact model. So we need to add the attitudes. Why do we need stakeholder engagement? Those people only yell at me. Well, when we master the right attitudes about each of the competences involved with projects, there's a doubling at least, I've seen a fourpling, of potential business performance impact when we master all of the competences at the attitudes level. When we move up to competence again, it's at least a two times factor once again and often moves to a four times factor. And once again in performance, it's consistently at least a two times performance compared to competence, but often exceeds that. So where would you rank your teams in these areas? Are they pretty much at the knowledge level, at the skill level, at the attitudes level, at the competence level? And what is this doing for the business performance impact that you're achieving with your projects? Some potential sources of the knowledge and then on to the competence and performance include bodies of knowledge. PMBOK Guide, originally developed by Bill Duncan in 1996, and now they're working on the sixth edition. That's a great starting point, at least for PM technical knowledge. And then ISO standards, that's a great place to go. The competency development framework from PMI 2007. IPMA's competence baselines, the ICB3 now emulated by other organizations, and now ICB4. Competence models, the project management competency model that, uh, that we've used for 35 years. The GAPS project program performance standards. This is a, this is a performance model for project and program management. So what talent areas do you need most? Because most of these, at least at the lower levels, deal primarily with technical PM topics. As we start getting down into the competence baseline, we're clearly getting into the interpersonal skills and enterprise uh, context. So which areas do you need the most? Stacy, we have a question. OK, go for it. <clears throat> and Can you, you tell us what is the difference between skill or competence and talent, specifically? <laughs> Good question. Let's, uh, let's go back several slides. Talent, I say, is the entire gamut that I've numbered one through five. So all of those are the talent levels. And then each of these has talent areas within. And each area, as we'll see, has more depth that we need to understand. So the whole gamut from one to five is PM or even business talent. Okay. Okay, and we have a follow-up question to that. Um, yes. Uh, one of our uh, participants assumed that talent had to do with the interpersonal skills of a PM professional. You had just described all sorts of different PM areas, calling them factors. Can you um, clarify the, your use of the term factors and how um, you see these factors as talents? I'm going back to... Uh to my hard copy of the, of the reference page. 
when I when I discussed the talent areas, the four talent areas, and I identified some of the factors in each talent area. So the interpersonal skills talent area has many more than these, but these are examples, and these are competence areas within interpersonal skills, for example, and technical PM. The, in the enterprise talent area, these are typical competences that I'd look for, and it's just a partial list. It's not a full and complete list. So interpersonal skills is one of the talent areas, and what we're looking for is in each talent area, having within the team, now I'll go back to the slide that we were on, we, are ha we have, remember we had from knowledge all the way up to performance, we want the ideal team to have someone in every talent factor in each talent area, such that the team scores a five in the product talent area, the team scores a five in the interpersonal talent area, the team scores a five in the enterprise talent area, and the team scores a five in the technical PM area, as opposed to not having anybody who has product talent or is weak in interpersonal talent. Does that make sense? Yes, I believe that that has been resolved. Thank you. Okay. So the key question, I would assert that it's not up to the project manager to bring all these talents to the team. Instead, the strength of the team is as strong as the weakest talent area the whole team demonstrates. So this is a good example of why we need diversity in the team in all kinds of areas, not just talent, but experience and areas of interest, because some people bring their interpersonal skills to the project, and they bring a great, a great gift there. It's also a, a reason why small projects have huge challenges, because small projects may only have one, two, or three people involved, and it's harder for a smaller team to bring this much talent to the table. So Stacy, um, one of yes. the comments is, competences then are synonymous with talent, and it includes all of those um, ideas that you just identified. It sounds a lot, a lot like complexity theory. Competences are sub-factors that contribute. So the existing old ICB3 had 46 competence areas, and those were just in the technical PM, enterprise context, and behavioral skills areas. So those are the building blocks of each of the major competence areas. I'm calling them talent areas, not competence, because to me, competence isn't the last level of the ladder. Competence is just level four. Companies don't want competence. That's just an input to the project. They want the results of the project. That's the performance. Okay, I'll, so, just, ask, I'll just ask the uh, participant who asked that question if that resolves that, if you could just pop a note on the questions. Thank you. So I've asserted that it's not just the project manager who needs to have talent. It's, in fact, everybody on the team. And so here's a question, and because we can't do, uh, you can all type in uh, the level that you want. Here's the question, though. We have three groups highlighted here, sponsor, the, the second level up resource manager, and the first level up resource manager. What talent level should those be if they're in your project? Would you be happy with somebody, with people uh, those people having just knowledge with a score of one, do they need to be skilled in their areas of responsibility? Do they need to score three attitudes? Do they need to score four competence? Or do they need to score five performance? Go ahead and type in the chat box the number, and if it's a if it's a, a range because you think it's different for different people, go ahead and put like uh, one to two or, or whatever. 
And Meg, if you can report what they what they say. I have no responses yet. Um, I do have one comment, though, um, in okay. the question area, which basically says that um, in our projects, finding competent people, Stacy's level four is even quite difficult. I totally agree. And part of the whole point of this presentation is that even great project managers fail when the organization doesn't understand how to support projects. So that person is absolutely correct. It's part of the reason why we have such a high failure rate. We depend on heroics instead of competent management of those project areas. So going ahead and continuing, the next question, what happens to the project if you have role talent gaps? Well, that's, that's exactly what I was just talking about. If you have people who are barely at level one or two, then it's not going to help the project hardly at all. The interesting thing I've seen is that you can spin people up if they have time, and if you have time as the project manager, and if they're willing. But note that attitudes is a willingness thing, and if they're not willing, and that often comes from pressure above, then it's difficult for everybody. So my assertion is this. I want level three or four at least with sponsor and the resource managers. And what I see all too often in projects is people who maybe they're not even at level one or they know a little bit. And this isn't about everything in the project. It's about the specific talents that they need for their role in the project. By the way, here's a, here's a, here's a resource in this area. The GAPS model, and I'll add this to the, uh, to the notes in the slides, the GAPS model for sponsor identifies what a good sponsor does. There are a lot of other resources out there, but those are the sponsor role performances that one should expect. It's one good example. So the bottom line, what happens to the project if you have role talent gaps? Well, you work your hearts out and you don't quite deliver. This is, again, the biggest challenge facing projects today. So in your own organization, which roles have the greatest potential for improvement? In working for 30 years with this model, what I've consistently found is that the ones that I've highlighted in yellow here are a, the easiest to fix, and B, the biggest improvements that you can make without doing anything with the project manager, the team members. Working with these three levels makes the biggest difference in business performance impact. Here's a model that's quite complex. We have two things going on here. The talent areas of product, those are in green, the enterprise, yellow, interpersonal, red, and technical PM. In the back, we see the role competence targets because for each layer, I don't say that everybody has to do everything. I say that the project sponsor or program sponsor has a handful of key things that she or he should do. And ideally, they would score performance five points for each of those things. Well, unfortunately, they don't always score performance. In fact, if we see the lowest slice on the chart, the resource manager is lowest in the product talent area. Well, this is a little bit of a difficulty because compared to the target, this person's also one of the lowest overall in the total score. So if you're the project manager of this project, this is a risk assessment. And in fact, you've got two players here, and in fact, the PM associate, the team members, this may be five or 10 or 20 different people. So this gap between the role competence targets and the actual is a high risk. Same problem here. So looking in aggregate at the two things we've discussed, one, the talent areas, and remember, under each of these talent areas is a whole range of individual competences or factors, and then for each of those, there may be some key competence indicators 
three to five for each in the new ICB-4, for, for example. So the senior project manager appears to be very close to ideal, but one great project manager by herself can't rescue a project. In this particular case, they need to work with other resource managers, a program sponsor, to bring in more of the right talent. And in the absence of that, great people produce a decent result, but it's not exactly what, the, what executive management expected. This is today's biggest challenge in the world of project management. Stacy. Yes. Excuse me, we have uh, one comment and a question. Um, regarding uh, the comment, it says, um, I work in the public sector infrastructure project segment. Our project sponsors have no technical talent, nor do they need to. What they need are political skills. Can you first comment on that? Okay, yes. As I said, each role has role competence targets. So the sponsor doesn't need to have very much technical skills. And in fact, often in the detailed models that are behind all of this, the key things that a sponsor, for example, needs to do is to have perhaps a one knowledge or two skill in understanding a project budget and a project schedule. They don't need to be great at building one, but they need to be able to read one and compare the difference between a plan and an actual. So behind all of this is role competences for each target area. So that's the, that's the answer to the first one. I don't expect that the sponsor is an expert at all the things that a project manager does, but they are expert in all of the things that sponsors should do. Uh, with that in mind, and looking at this particular um, graphic, uh, where we look at the project program sponsor on the have versus this, the behind column, which this should have, would you suggest then that this model is this particular graphic represents a model more suited to business versus public infrastructure, uh, and that it might no, and that it might change over time depending on what any individual is required based on their sector. Yeah, I think that. First of all, this would vary depending on the culture of the organization and the industry it's in, so I agree there. But secondly, I spent 15 years in local government that dealt with everything from uh, road design and things like that all the way through sanitary systems and land use planning. And I saw the same needs for sponsors in the things that I define as rural competences there as I do in a pharma or a defense contract today. These things are always set by companies that start with our model and then tailor it to their own preferences, and that's an executive level adjustment of the baseline model. So the, the high representation of requirement for the sponsor in this particular example on the technical PM things may only be two or three things that they should score themselves on, whereas there may be, for the project manager, be uh, 22 things that, the, that they're scoring on. So the role competences are only the, the roles, or only the competences that are specific to that particular role. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mick. So moving on, talent retention. Now note that we didn't really talk about how do you develop the talent. Uh, I spent the last uh, 30 years doing that, and there are a whole bunch of uh, articles on the IPMA USA website that, that cover all of that. So as difficult as it is to develop it, which is more challenging, developing it or retaining it? Well, my experience is that both are difficult, so that's a non-answer. The keys, though, to retaining talent is responding quickly when things go wrong and correctly, because there are a lot of people who do knee-jerk reactions, and it's the wrong reaction. Maintaining team motivation and morale. And whose job is that? And when we lose talent, act quickly and wisely, applying proper PM practices, in other words, eating our own dog food, and in responding quickly or correctly. When things do go wrong, whether it's uh, losing some funding, losing a, a, a team member or whatever, the typical th thing that happens is risk, cost, and time tends to go up. But the good news is that one thing does go down, and that's quality. Well, maybe that's not quite so good. 
So what can managers do when this happens? Well, there are two patterns. The flaw pattern is to put pressure on the team to deliver anyway, which kills team motivation. Smart managers actually do a completely different set of actions. They ask, how can I help? What can we do? And usually, a project team has a number of answers about what we can do. So there's a huge difference in times of crisis between what smart managers do and what not yet smart managers tend to do. The factors that, uh, that affect motivation. Hertzberg stuff has popular, been popular for about 30 years, and he talks about the hygiene and motivation factors. So even though uh, Maslow and McClelland and a whole bunch of other people also deal with motivation, Hertzberg stuff still works well. So the first, the first thing is recognize and reward the project results. And it's not just rewarding the project manager, it's rewarding the whole team. Rapid response with communication up and down. A presence, personal thank you. A barriers buster mentality. The ability to push the barriers out of the way, that's one of the responsibilities I place on sponsors. Becoming the umbrella for the unbearable pressures and open-ended commitment to getting the job done no matter what it takes. Now, project teams respond well to support, poorly to pressure and threats, and I'll tell a short story here. I was working with a major insurance company. I'd worked with them for about six years, and we were building a corporate portfolio management system. We brought together 20 program and project managers and their sponsors for the top projects and programs of the company. We had one exercise where different people were going through the different groups that were on that stacked charts model. The group that was talking about the responsibilities of the sponsor were very, very noisy and they had two pages of flip charts with recorded all the things a sponsor should do. And all of a sudden they got really, really quiet. I walked over and I said, gee, sounded like you were on a roll, but all of a sudden you went quiet. What happened? And the person with the pen, who was the VP of marketing, said, you're right, we're on a roll. But I looked at this after two pages and I asked the question, this is a great list. Is anybody doing any of this? I see that over and over and over in, in organizations. And the good news is that we trained the sponsors and the resource managers in all the things that they needed to do. That was in the uh, early 1990s, and they're still running hot today. The factors that affect motivation is all the players demonstrating the role competences that are needed, not just the project managers. Managing talent retention and loss. When you do lose talent, the first thing you hope for is that you've got collateral so that you've got at least the explicit knowledge captured. This comes from interviews, from meetings, meeting minutes, accurate plans versus actuals, project documents, product documents, which are different, because the product, the product documents include the requirements, the change management plans, the planned testing, the acceptance test criteria, the documentation for the user. I look for emails and correspondence. I look for change orders and cha open change requests. I look for the, the troika of risks, issues, and lessons learned. Now, it takes appropriate governance to have this collateral available because in some organizations, they skip all this stuff because they don't have time for it. Well, so you're out of luck if you start losing talent. This is really a risk management issue, and this is the second time I've mentioned this being a risk management function. We can prevent we can hedge talent capture before we lose it. We can intervene, act for talent transfer, and we can recover, scavenge whatever we can to mitigate the impact. Just as in other kinds of risk management, an ounce of prevention is worth a kilogram of cure. A couple of examples of talent loss actions, because when this happens, we lose team members, how do we transfer knowledge? How do we maintain the motivation, and how do we keep the momentum? Some sample losses include losing an internal customer, they're reassigned elsewhere, or the project manager of a strategic project leaves the company, another. 
One third of the team, that's scary, moves to a higher priority project. That's really scary. A key developer in a scrum-based agile team leaves. Project sponsor promoted, she or he leaves your division. Well, those are a lot of different talent losses. And if we pick the first one, the talents that are lost, if the internal customers reassigned, which things do you think we've lost the most? Is it technical project management? Is it interpersonal skills? Is it the business context? Is it the, is it the product area? Well, we'll assert that in this particular situation, it's product, enterprise, and interpersonal. So here was her profile across all of her needed role competences. Now, the sponsor may look a little bit like this, which goes back to that earlier question of I wouldn't necessarily expect the sponsor to have all that high technical PM competence areas. The actions to consider. Replace that internal customer with another savvy customer and uh, assign her other job responsibilities to someone else from the same work group. Now, some people will say, well, that's pretty idealistic. Well, of course it is. The whole purpose of project management is to change the organization and the way the organization works. And if we can't change the climate that we're working in, we can't deliver successful projects. And the difference between those who succeed consistently and those who don't succeed consistently isn't the project manager's skills, whether they're certified or not. It's the skills, the attitudes, the competences, and the performance of all the people above that project manager. Also, manage several weeks overlap. Yeah, that's really hard to do too. Sometimes you find out on the day that person left, and it takes two weeks just to find somebody to replace them, if ever. Establish rapport within the team. You can't just bring them in, sit them down with the open work items that the, the departing customer was working on. You need to recreate that team so that it's got the momentum to continue. Review and discuss things from your project collateral. In this case, the elements of business requirements, your testing and validation plan, your organizational change management status, your benefits realization plan, your stakeholder management plan. You see, there's not a lot of emphasis on the technical things. There's emphasis on the things that that talent needs to bring to this project. Some people think the talent and a project team's all interchangeable. Well, we lost a customer. Who around here isn't doing anything important? Well, a competent project manager knows exactly what strengths we're looking for. And just as an example of the need for strengths, Barry Beam for IT projects talked about how a 90th percentile analyst, in other words, a top 10 percenter, who has extensive experience in both the application area and the platform can reduce overall project effort, which translates to cost, by 63% compared with one who's average 50th percentile in those two areas. Now, that's just one particular example, and it's just the product competences, not considering the other competence element areas. The other talent contributors can be project managers, customers, sponsors, and resource managers, and of course, the existing the rest of the working project team. So it's not just interchangeable headcount. Wrapping up here, a talented and appropriate action would be to treat talent changes like any other project change. This was actually suggested by my wife, Rose, when we were working on updating a methodology. And she said, well, why don't you consider a talent change just like a change of scope or any other kind of change control process, managed the same way? evaluate the impact, reverse the changes if the impact is too great, or come up with a smart way to implement this change. Let's use our own tools to manage the risk of talent changes, just like we do with others, and help us practice what we preach. If we actually manage the way we say we should manage projects, other vital signs, what can this do for team motivation? The problem is, who knows enough to do this talent impact evaluation? What do they need to know, in addition, of course, to the things we presented in this webinar? 
to summarize and take and do some takeaways here, uh, because we can't uh, read your takeaways, I'll just share with you three takeaways that are relevant for your workplace that have come from organizations that have implemented this stuff. First, my managers need to watch this. Second, business success from projects does rely on strong, competent, and performing project managers, but it also relies on business business engagement, and it's not just our project and program managers who need to have PM talent. So this is time for questions and your follow-on actions. And so Meg, if you've got additional questions, uh, let's cover those now and then let's do a quick preview of our next webinar. Hello everyone. If you want to go into the questions box and enter any of your questions now, we'll take them. I'll give you all a couple of minutes or a minute or two. Uh, I see a question in the chat from a long time ago, if we include all of these criteria in a talent search, would we possibly exclude some quality individuals? I think that's a great question. And it depends on the mix that you already have on a team. If, if you've got quality individuals and you can identify what talent they bring, the key question is whether they bring the talent you need most or not. Perhaps you can swap out other talent because I think everybody is a quality individual, but some people bring more desperately needed talent to the team than others. Now, the other question is, who are you? Are you the project manager? Because this model is useful for the project manager, not in selecting people, but managing upwards in the people you do need. A lot of project managers don't have the authority to select. So I would never use this model to exclude people, I would use this model to take the quality people and help them to move into the areas that we need, but this is moving beyond knowledge, beyond skills, beyond attitudes, and moving them into competence. Stacy, we do have one question. Some yeah. vol volunteers disappear during the project process. Can you suggest uh, how that can affect it or be affect or how that can affect the project as well as how a team can handle the fact that volunteers are disappearing? Well, first of all, remember the, the difficulty of, of transferring explicit uh, knowledge. So what, we're, what you're looking at, I would, I would recommend that people read the Chinaka book that, uh, that I mentioned. It, it will be in the presentation notes that, uh, that are available. So one of the best things that consistently helps is closure meetings whether it's a closure of an individual assignment, a closure of a phase, or even a closure of a, uh, of a deliverable, like getting the requirements, that moves, that's essentially what the book says, that moves it from explicit knowledge that's written down to the synthesis of other people's experience. In a case where other people are, uh, are coming aboard, it's good for them to sit in on those meetings because, like, as you say, you don't know in a volunteer situation whether those people that you've got today are going to be in the next session or not. I use recording of some meetings as a way to help transmit some of that. It's better than reading it because you can see the emotions. So that can help. But the truth is, in a volunteer position, it's much more difficult because you're right. People work their hearts out and then uh, the work-life balance takes over because this volunteer work is in addition to their work life and in addition to their own life. Okay, um, we have uh, two comments um, just to comment on if, if you feel you'd like to. Um, one comment is that uh, in many European ministries selecting the right talent for a certain position is a dream come true. In reality, we are faced with efficiency targets and an overall 20% reduction target of personnel. People are often forced to leave or fill positions they really shouldn't. How could this possibly help? <laughs> okay, the, the first thing is to go back to the page where we talked about how project talent is completely different than everyday operations talent. People who only know how to manage operations don't have a clue, and in fact, they typically do exactly what this commentator says. In operations, you starve the talent and you keep good, 
control of the quality. And when quality starts to fail, only then do you add back the talents needed. So it's, a, it's an efficiency mentality as uh, far more than an effectiveness mentality. If you apply that mentality with projects, starve it for talent, then because it's a one-time occurrence, you've destroyed the project before it even starts. Starving it of talent makes it cost more, makes it taste, uh, take longer, reduces the quality of the results, and dissatisfies everyone. So you manage a project environment in a totally opposite way than you manage an operations environment. And I've seen some of my best clients in government, both in Europe and in the US, but also in South America, I'll add, who understand fully how to manage a project environment. In my work in government, I actually managed projects that evaluated the impact of pending legislation. And there's nothing harder to manage than a bunch of senators and congresspeople. But again, those organizations learn how to manage projects more effectively. A great project manager by herself cannot manage a not yet competent project enterprise. So government is no better and no worse than other kinds of organizations, but all organizations have the ability to manage far better all of their projects. And just as a follow-on to that, my experience in taking leaders, industry leaders, is that over a three to five year period, it's possible to take industry leaders even and to generate a 10 times more effective measured by the cost to deliver business results organization. And one time, after auditing those results, the organization that had just demonstrated to their executive management that 10 times improvement sat down to identify their next 10 times improvement. It's that easy if you have executive management and middle managers on board. Project managers by themselves cannot totally change an organization. Thank you, Stacy. Um, we have just one comment, which is, of course, I think what we all agree, there's been uh, quite a bit of truly substantive information in your presentation, which we thank you for. We're coming to the end. If you could go ahead and close up, that would be great. Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and go to the uh, invitation for the next webinar, and we will learn all about ICB4. Uh, Tim Jakes, who was on the development team and is instrumental in a range of IPMA's products, will enthrall us with the discussion about competence, the ICB4, the domains that we've kind of touched on here, and we invite you to, the sign up is open today, so we invite you to register and participate in that. Thank you, you all, for uh, participating. Thank you very much, Meg, for, for your, your work in uh, moderating. And this, the, the video will be posted today, as will the uh, notes for the session. Okay, that brings to an end our February webinar, and we look forward to seeing you back here again in March for the ICB introduction webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.